It takes 10,000 points. You get 25 points for each receipt. Sometimes if you buy a certain thing, you get more points. Good morning, church. There's some Sundays, right? Everybody's like, but pastor, it's really nice outside. I can't come to church, right? It's the last nice Sunday that we're going to get the rest of the calendar year. That's okay. It often happens when the same people then say, but pastor, it's raining. Or, but pastor, it's snowing. <laughs> After a while, you start to think that maybe it's not the weather. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to worship on this 20th Sunday after Pentecost as we are kind of getting ourselves all put together and ready for worship. Um, this is, un we're entering into a very busy time of the year um, for the church. Um, it, always, it doesn't always feel like this, but in the next few Sundays, we're, we've got Reformation Sunday next Sunday. Um, we have All Saints Sunday the week after that, and the week after that we're actually having confirmation here at Genesis Lutheran Church, and so um, everybody put those on, their, on your calendars now. I know I'll do um, announcements later, but hint, hint, wink, wink, you know, maybe <laughs> it's just something to think about as we keep going forward. Um, but it is a great time to be church. It is a glorious um, day here in the metro Detroit area for those of you who are Watching from other places around the country and around the world, I hope that you are well this morning um, or this afternoon, because I know that some of our folks who are actually across the Atlantic, it's mid-afternoon, and so it's, it's tea time where they're watching worship at this point. But think about that for just two seconds, the way in which that this community gathers. Slowly but surely, we gather together to worship God, to come together to lift up our thanks and our praises. But one of the other things that we do is that it's important for us regularly to offer not only our thanks and our praise, but also our confession. Amen. And as you will see in the bulletin today, we're going to begin worship with what is called a confession and absolution, the refrain this Sunday, um, at least for most of the um, call to worship, is, Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I think that's one of those things that we don't like to have to admit in our world today. It's like there's something that we're allergic to about admitting our own failings. That saying, I'm sorry, or I did something wrong, has become something that is, I don't know, I just, I find it to be a very interesting and problematic development that we are no longer willing to confess. And so it's important for us as church, not only to do this for ourselves, which it is, I mean, first and foremost, confession and all the rest is for us. Right? It's about strengthening our relationship with God. It's about strengthening our relationship with one another. But as Christians, it's also good for us to model this behavior. Because for too long and for far too many Christians, we've not modeled that behavior. And I wonder if the world saw it a little bit more often we'd be a little better off. And so let's stand here in the congregation, and for those of you who are at home, please stand as well as we offer our confession. And again, the refrain is, O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. O oh Lord, our God, our sins speak for themselves the things we've done, and the things we've left undone. Oh, how they separate us from you. Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
We stand before you with hard hearts and cool passion. We wander away and yet wonder where you have gone. O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We are distracted by false gods that glitter and offer empty promises. We rely on idols that have no power. O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. In the end, O oh Lord, we are spent poured out, thirsty and tired, we feel alone. O God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Save us, O Lord, by your power. Revive and renew us. Draw us close that we might see your face again. O God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The God of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Leah, the God of the everlasting covenant pours out grace and mercy upon you. The God who is Lord over life and death. The cross and the empty tomb forgives you and your sins. The Lord Jesus brings you to everlasting life. We humble ourselves before you, O Lord, in trust that you will exalt us. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, David. Good morning. Good morning, Genesis. Good morning. Good morning. It's so wonderful to be here today. Yeah. We actually have some nice weather today, huh? Yeah. <laughs> we'll take it based upon how we know Michigan um, will switch up on you. But we know that our God won't switch up on us. Amen. And that's one thing to be thankful for and praise God for. Amen. 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 So it came to mind, I was, I was on the way to church today, and this song came to my, to my spirit, and it was, it goes, what a mighty God we serve, what a mighty God we serve. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from you. Bless those who will read to us the scriptures. Make us hunger for the word of life. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. The first lesson is Jeremiah chapter 14, verses 7 through 10, and then we skip to verses 19 through 22. Although our iniquities testify against us, act, O Lord, for your name's sake. Our apostates indeed are many, and we have sinned against you. Our hope of Israel is Savior in time of trouble. Why should you be like a stranger in the land, like a traveler turning aside for the night? Why should you be like someone confused, like a mighty warrior who cannot give help. Yet you, O Lord, are in the midst of us, and we are called by your name. Do not forsake us. Thus says the Lord concerning this people, truly they have loved to wander. They have not restrained their feet. Therefore, the, lo the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquities and punish their sins. Verse 19, have you completely rejected Judah? Does your heart loathe Zion? Why have you struck us down so that there is no healing for us? We look for peace, but find no good. For a time of healing, but there is, a, there is terror instead. We acknowledge our wickedness, O Lord, the iniquities of our ancestors, for we have sinned against you. Do not spurn us for your name's sake. Do not dishonor your glorious throne. Remember and do not break your covenant with us. Can any idols of the nations bring rain? Or can the heaven give shower? Is it not you, O Lord our God? We set our hopes on you, for it is you who do all this. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Our psalm for today is Psalm 84, and we will read responsibly verses 1 through 7. Amen? Amen? How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul sings indeed. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a rest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars. O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As we go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. Their early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. Here ends the reading of the Psalms. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Genesis. Good morning. Good morning to all those out on Facebook and all those other things they got out there, Twitters, and what is all that they have out there. Uh, we welcome you and thank you for joining us in our service. I'll be reading from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Amen. 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 And then 16 through 18. As for me, 
I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearance. 16. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them, but the Lord stood by me and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. May God have a blessing to the reading of this word. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter, verses 9 through 14. Amen. Luke writes, He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this, this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I'll tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the gospel of our Lord. Greater, our God is stronger, Lord. 
Thank you, Jesus. Yes, you're great. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Sometimes we get so focused on looking at each other, judging each other, that we forget what God does for us. Right? It's easy. It really is. All you have to do is open your mouth and you can put anybody in your place just to make yourself feel better. And I'm thinking about this, not only because of the song we just sang, but just listen to the gospel today. It's a tough little parable, isn't it? Not a lot of room to roam. So I want you to think of it this way. Two people, because, and I'll say this first, we already know who the good guy is, right? Uh -huh. Okay, you just hold on to that. <laughs> just, just hold on to that. Two people walk into Genesis Lutheran Church for the very first time. One, you can tell immediately, is a good person. Well, I need to talk to them a couple minutes because they actually came before church started, which automatically makes some of us suspicious, really. Why are they early? What do they want? But you talk to this person, and it's a good person. Good, fair. Talk to them about their business. You talk to them about their life just a little bit. It's evident that they love their family, patient, kind. This is a good person. The other person comes in and you talk to them, and the moment you do, you get that feeling. You know that this guy is a crook. And he's happy about it because he has made a lot of money being a crook. He's a shakedown artist, kind of person who has been given legal license to go to each and every one of us and offer us protection. It'd be a shame if something were to happen to you, kind of protection. Now, back to the first one. Not only have you discovered that this person is good and honest and loving, they're also deeply religious. Well. They just moved in, just looking for a church. It was one of the first things they did. They pray. They've already put in a check that is clearly a tithe. And they give God the glory for everything. The other one only seems to have rolled in because of the guilt that is clearly eating him alive. The cumulative weight of all of his grift and the damage it has wrought on families throughout our neighborhood is so much he just can't stand himself anymore. Oh, and yes, the first one looks at the second and says, oh, thank God I'm not like him. <laughs> so, which one do you want to join the church? Uh -huh. the cat. Ah, wait. <laughs> Don't give me the bunny answer. Do you know what the bunny answer is? There's a little girl sitting in Sunday school. She was listening intently to the Sunday school teacher describing something and then asking, what is it? The teacher says, what is furry, has long legs and a bushy tail? 
The little girl knows exactly what the Sunday school teacher is describing. She also knows this is Sunday school. And the answer the teacher always seems to expect is exactly the same. And so she says, even though she knows in the back of her mind that this is a bunny, she says, it's Jesus. <laughs> so allow me to ask again. Which one do you want to join the church? Now, I know the answer that the parable is leading us to. Right? And yes, we would absolutely welcome the tax collector. Absolutely. But let's be honest. If the Pharisee, the first person I described, were to join the church, we would be thrilled. Don't kid yourself. We'd put them on leadership or install them as one of the ministers before the first snow accumulated on the ground this winter. But, but pastor, the text what Jesus says, the humility of the tax collector, the self-righteousness of the Pharisee. Yeah, I know. I get it. Jesus, in telling the parable the way he does, sets us up to focus only on the lack of humility in the Pharisee. But it's really helpful to remember that when Jesus tells a parable... It ain't a straightforward morality tale. I mean, yes. I mean, if you take nothing else away from the service today, other than really good music, yes, be humble. Confess your sins. If you've really exploited people, stop doing that. Right? Show a little humility. But there's something much deeper at play here. And it has to do with how we, as human beings, love judgment. We love it. Nothing makes us happier than we're saying about somebody else, look at that person. And one of the gravest errors that the church, not just Genesis, the whole thing, throughout all 2,000 years, the thing, the, one of the greatest errors the church has ever made is to focus almost exclusively on a question that ends with you figuring out somebody else's place. Because well. the church has spent a lot of time asking the question that's already been answered. Know what it is? Who is going to heaven? Are you going to heaven? I mean, honestly, I still see billboards all over the place. Is your place secured in heaven? And I got an answer that I'm sure the person who put up the billboard doesn't want to hear. We have spent so much time working out that question and who we have decided is definitely in and who is definitely out <laughs> that it's crowded out everything else. We look at the Pharisee, right? And we even say it just like that. Like there's a built-in sneer in our voice. Go, oh, Pharisees. I hate to tell you, Jesus, being the good rabbi he was and believing the things that he did, was a Pharisee. Did you know that? Just think of that the next time you use that word like it's an epithet. Jesus was a Pharisee. He's talking to his own people, which is why he's always busting on them so hard. Because he knows they know better. 
So we look at this Pharisee and we point out their self-righteous condescension without realizing that while we're doing it, we're doing exactly the same thing, right? We may as well be saying, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this Pharisee. Yeah, the Pharisee was wrong. That's really easy to say. But does that make the tax collector right? Because we've just let him off the hook, and he's literally been taking money out of your pocket <laughs> as much as he can get, and it's all legal. But you say, but pastor, it's the humility. It's the honesty. He admits his sins. Great. Good. I mean that. Good for him. We should do that. But is that all it takes? I mean, let me spin out this story. It's not in Scripture, but let me spin this out one more week. May I? <laughs> what if the tax collector, in all of his humility, were to walk out the doors of our church and get right back to the business of fleecing you for everything you've got? And then next Sunday, he rolls in going, oh, forgive me, I'm a sinner. Right? What then? Or how about this? What if next week, the Pharisee rolls into church and keeps that self-righteousness to himself? Never says a word. Just the good person that he is, except for that self-righteous bit. What if both of them got just a little bit better next week? How about if both of them got a lot worse next week? What then? Does that make you think about them differently? Are you rearranging your heavenly rankings? And there's the problem. We are so focused on judging somebody else's fitness for heaven that we forget what Jesus has actually called us to focus on. I mean, let's be honest. Jesus is calling us, every one of us, to live better lives. That's an easy one. You shouldn't be self-righteous, and you shouldn't be a crook. Right? Sin is sin, and Jesus would rather us not do them. Even the ones that you're seeing in the back of the mind, but what I'm doing, that's not really sin. <laughs> My sins aren't really sin. Your sins are really terrible. You should stop that. But mine, oh, you know, it's just a little. Sin is sin. Jesus would rather us not do them. Jesus would rather us work for each other, for our neighbor, for our society. Jesus wants us to do better. Which is why Jesus spends a lot of time talking about repentance. Right? But the church, and I don't know about you, I, I did a little bit of a search this week. You know how many preachers are so worked up about whether you're going to get into heaven or not? And all I want to think of is, hey, fella, have you looked in the mirror? And then I thought to myself, wait a minute, that doesn't matter. We have worked so hard to get people in the pew so focused solely on whether or not your cosmic tote board gets you to the magic number. Oh, look at that. You've hit the mark. Good for you. The church has likewise encouraged us to rate sins, right? I mean, sure. 
I dipped into the till, but it's not like I killed somebody. <laughs> Don't we do that all the time? Well, that sin's much worse than that one. Really? I don't remember some divine ranking. So we sit back and we count all the ways that someone else isn't going to gain entrance into the pearly gates. And then blithely assuming that we're going to make it in without any work whatsoever. Or if the preachers have really poured on the fire and brimstone, all we've got is fear and despair that we're ever going to get anywhere close. The church has exhausted itself and its members who are leaving in droves because they're tired of their church saying, where are you going to spend eternity? Well, I'm worried about food on my table tomorrow. Thanks. Maybe you want to use some of that vast amount of wealth, and instead of buying another airplane to get to the next conference, how about you open a soup kitchen? How about you make it easier so that people can vote? Everybody. How about you fix houses in your neighborhood instead of saying to the people during a hurricane, no, that's okay, please don't come in. You might get mud on the floor. And then I'll have to hire somebody to clean that. We're exhausted. The church is spent because we have been guilty of the most egregious case of gatekeeping the world has ever known. You're in, you're out, right? But here's the thing. That's not the way it works at all. The tax collector isn't justified because of his humility. The tax collector isn't justified because of his honesty. Those are good things. Make no mistake. But that's not what gets him justified. The tax collector is justified, which simply means made right with God because of what Jesus did. Period. That's what the cross is for. Through no work or merit of your own, your scorecard has been wiped clean. You are justified not by what you do, but because God loves you. You're in. Jesus punched your ticket as he was hanging on the cross. And now you're saying that wasn't enough? That's not good enough? That's not strong enough? We always talk about how Jesus is strong, and then we turn around and go, yeah, but not that strong. Not strong enough to save you because of your sins. You're in. The tax collector, he's in. The Pharisee, in. That's what grace means. And that breaks our brains a bit. <laughs> we don't like it. We say it's too easy, pastor. Oh, you're right. The cross was a walk in the park. We can't quite wrap our brain and heart around the fact that we are saved. We are made right with God, not because of what we do or what we feel or the attitude that we have or even what we believe but because Jesus knew that we could never get there on our own. 
And so, because of his love and compassion for us, each one of us, Jesus did it for us. Because that's the truth. Whether Pharisee or tax collector or our very own brand of broken vessel, we can't get there on our own. We just can't. And Jesus looks at us, looks at you, and knows you can't get there. Knows I can't get there. Not on my own. And so out of his unconditional love for you, Jesus saved you. And now, and now you are free to live the way that you were created to live. As my old professor used to say, now that you don't have anything to do, what are you going to do? Right? Now that you don't have anything to do, worrying about getting into heaven or worrying about somebody else getting into heaven, what are you going to do? Living the life Christ called you to live right now. So how will you live? You're set free. You're liberated. You don't have to worry about the big question. It's already been answered. So what are you going to do? How are you going to live? I mean, okay, so yeah, listening to the text today, let's start with humility. A little humility in this world goes a long way, right? I mean, frankly, if we looked at our world today, if a lot of people who are saying they want to lead the country had just a little bit more humility, just admitted every now and then that they screwed up, that would be a good thing. Right? So yes, show humility. Be honest about your own shortcomings. I, I hate to break it to us, none of us are perfect. All I have to do to realize that is look in the mirror and go, ooh, wow. So yes, yeah, show humility. Be honest about your shortcomings, but also work to undo any damage you have done with your actions or inactions. I mean, yes, don't be self-righteous, but also don't oppress people. And then let's keep making that list and following through on it. Don't be a bigot. Don't objectify people. Don't exploit people. Don't just think that little white lies are fine. They're fine. Don't think that nursing your grudge is somehow exempt. Right? You should stop nursing your grudges, Pastor. How about your own? And it's not just the thou shalt not. It's what we get to do. Build bigger tables. Tear down walls and borders that separate us, that seek to divide or exclude just because we somehow don't accept you. How about we stop doing that knowing that we are all created in God's image, created good in God's image. Let's work for peace. And not just this kind of amorphous, you know, we hope that there's no more war, but in our very own lives. Let's love kindness. And not think that being kind is somehow weak. When did we get that into our heads? That being nice is somehow weakness. I think it's much harder to be kind and it shows greater strength. 
show mercy. Forgive. Work for justice. I mean, we got a couple weeks before election day. Get out there and encourage people to use their voice. Give God the glory for the things that you've been able to do, or even just getting out of bed this morning. Love as God loves you. Unconditionally. Without determining your merit, your worthiness, do those things. But do them not because of a reward you might receive, but because it's a way of giving thanks for the gift you've already been given. The deed is done when Jesus says, it is accomplished. What was being accomplished was your salvation. God's love made incarnate, made real, so that you wouldn't have to worry about that. And then, and then say to both the Pharisee and the tax collector, Welcome to Genesis. Because they're going to fit right in among all their fellow sinners who have all fallen short of the glory of God, but who are all justified, made right in God's eyes through the love of Jesus Christ. Welcome them in. Because that, is what Jesus calls us to do. Welcome, include, feed, clothe, walk with, be there for them in their difficult times. Lift them up. Let them know that they are welcome, just as we are all welcome at the Lord's table. And then, let's, all of us, all of us, do better tomorrow. Which is what Jesus really wants us to focus on. The question's been answered. You're in. Now what are you going to do? Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. I have an exceptionally long list of announcements that I will try to move through with some haste because I don't want my... Um, announcements to be longer than the sermon, which you're thinking, no, that's all right, Pastor, you know, we'll get something out of it today. Um, Got a couple of things to, um, so first off, I just want to say that um, we have two birthdays on Tuesday of this week. Melvin Gilchrist and Ranielle Reeves celebrate their birthdays today, so happy birthday to both of them. Um, If you have the opportunity, please um, drop them a card or let them know that you're thinking about them on their birthdays. Um, There is a leadership meeting immediately following worship today. So get your coffee. Don't run away. You have to go to the meeting. Either that or Sarita's going to stand at the door and say, nope, that way. (laughs) Just saying. Um, Gracious Savior puts on a Christmas concert every year. Um, In order to prepare for that, they are um, starting their rehearsals. Every 5.30, uh, 5.30 on Thursdays, Gracious Savior will be um, rehearsing for their Christmas concert. And so if you would like to be involved in their choir, um, talk to Jackie, because I know that you're still, you're doing this, yes, this year? Um, But then... Gracious Savior, 5.30 on Thursdays. Speaking of concerts, um, please put on your calendar Wednesday, November 2nd. 
Wednesday, November 2nd, at 7 p.m., we are going to be having an anniversary concert. Um, this, or next Sunday, actually, um, is Genesis Lutheran Church's 39th anniversary. So, yeah, 39 years here on the corner of Mac and Grand Boulevard. And in celebration, um, our music um, staff... Um, David Billy, Mike Harrison, um, Mike has hired a couple um, musicians, upright bass, and I think a sax, um, Mr. Roland Chandler. Um, we're gonna, they're just going to put on a show. They're going to put on a concert. We have such gifted musicians, um, and this is going to be from all over the place. I mean, it's not just gospel music, but it's also blues and jazz, and um, I've let the musicians essentially have free reign on the program. I don't know what's going to happen. It's going to be exciting. <laughs> I'm very much looking forward to it. But 7 o'clock, Wednesday, November 2nd. Um, please come. There'll be fellowship afterwards. This is just a great way for us to celebrate um, 39 years and not just the things that we've done in the past, but where we're going in the future. And so I'm really looking forward to that. A couple of other um, dates to put on the calendar. Next Sunday is Reformation Sunday. And you're thinking, what's that? It's all about the ongoing reformation of the church, that the church is, and I know this is a shocking thing, it's supposed to adapt. It's supposed to move with the times. It's supposed to evolve. Um, because what we're trying to do more than anything is to share the love and grace of God with everybody. Um, and so we have, to con we have to continually remind ourselves that we've got to get better at this. And so the reformation is about that. So next Sunday, Reformation Sunday, wear red, all right? That's the color for um, festivals of the church. And speaking of festivals of the church, um, the first Sunday in November is All Saints Sunday. That's when we remember those who have, um, are dearly departed. If you would like to bring pictures or other mementos, we put them on the altar or around the front. Um, that's the first Sunday in November. And November 13th, and you're thinking, Pastor, are we just going to go throughout all of these days to the end of the year? I'm only saying this because November 13th, we're going to be celebrating confirmation or the affirmation of baptism for four of our young people. Um, Aaron Maria, Ivan Maria, um, Mari Montgomery, and um, William Garland, who is my nephew. Um, they were the ones who went to camp this summer. Um, and we are going to be celebrating confirmation or their affirmation of the vows that were made on their behalf at baptism. That's a big deal, right? Let's be here to support these young people because we always say the church of tomorrow is the young people, and, but this is your good old golden opportunity to support them, right? Um, we, we give thanks for their faithfulness, for their witness, for their big questions and their dedication. And so if we want the church to continue, one of the things that we have to do is to support our youth in all that they do. So that's November 13th. Put it on your calendars. It's going to be a special day, and I just want everybody to come out for that. All right, last three things. Um, there's a Genesis Hope community meeting this Wednesday at 6 o'clock. And next Saturday, the, the 29th, Genesis Hope is partnering with the Field Street Block Club and Brilliant Detroit to do a harvest festival out here on our lawn. Um, and this is going to be a big deal. Um, in fact, um, the special guest for this weekend or for the day is the Detroit Pistons are coming. Okay. That starts at 1.30 this Saturday. Um, and so this is something that they've been working on, just a way to celebrate with the community and the neighborhood. And so come out for that. Um, I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, hopefully the rain will hold off. If not, they're going to put up big tents out there, so it's going to be very nice. Um, just come for an opportunity to be a part of our neighborhood. And it's all going to be outside, so it's all taken care of. Um, the folks who've been putting this together, Janine Spencer and other folks from Genesis Hope, have really done some marvelous work in um, putting this all together. So take advantage of that. All right, last two things. Um, there's a box out in the fellowship hall um, that 
talks about um, the Stocktober food drive. Um, this is for the food pantry at University of Michigan Dearborn and Henry Ford College. Um, it's being run by the campus ministry of UM Dearborn, um, Henry Ford, and Wayne State. Um, not surprisingly, students don't always have everything they need um, to provide for themselves. And one of the ways that we can help is to stock their food pantry. And so you can look out in the box. Um, there's a list um, of the things they actually specifically need. Um, they're, they're very smart to have people shop to a list. If you need a copy of this, I can get a copy for you. I um, was at Kroger yesterday, and I bought one of the, um, you know, their own shopping bags, and I filled it with stuff that, from the list. And other folks have already done that as well. And so I encourage you to do that. Um, one of the things that we do at Genesis Lutheran Church, one of the great ministries, I mean, other than our music ministry, which we celebrate and we give thanks for, we also do a lot for helping to feed people. Um, the um, feeding or helping to fill up the food pantry is consistent with the work that we are already doing, which leads to adopt a family. And you're thinking, it's October, Pastor. Why are we talking about adopt a family? Because we're doing 130 baskets this year, and it takes us time. Um, time and resources so that we can build up so that we can um, just, so that we can um, help people um, have a meal on their table for Christmas and presents under the tree. And so I thank Jackie and Sarita and Crystal and all the others who are helping with this. This is a huge undertaking, but one of the most important things that we can do. And so I want you to prayerfully consider how you can participate. And that's both with the things that you can donate, but also with your time and your talents. Um, because I guarantee you that Jackie can always use the help for adopt a family. It's a big project. Um, and Sarita and Crystal, they do a great job, but um, I'm sure they wouldn't mind to have a little help as well. <laughs> All right. I believe, whew, that's a lot. But you know what? And I, I say this all the time. Lots of announcements is a church doing mission and ministry. And we must always keep that ministry first. That's why we're here. We gather together. And Sunday morning is no less ministry. I guarantee you that. Worship, the music, the, the gifts of the choir, the, the building that we are in. This is a gift to this community and to our neighborhood. And so give thanks for all the ministries of Genesis Lutheran Church and find a way for you to plug into those, to be a part of that. Um, and I know sometimes you're like, oh, I can't do one more thing. Luther said that the best thing, I have so much to do that I need to spend the first three hours in prayer. It helps us reorient. It helps us on the right, to get on the right path to go where Jesus has called us to go. And that's good stuff. All right, thank you. Those are all the announcements um, for this morning. At this time, what we'll do is we'll take a big collective deep breath, set the table for communion, and then continue with the prayers of the church.
in gratitude and humility. Let us join together in prayer on behalf of all of God's creation. God of mercy, you are in the midst of us and we are called by your name. Inspire your church to serve and love all people with the unceasing grace you extend to us. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God of all creation, you formed a world where even the sparrow finds a home. Preserve the beauty and diversity of all creatures with whom we share the earth. Lead us to protect all living things. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God of peace, you are an ever-present help in time of trouble. Rescue families and nations torn apart by violence and warfare. Unite all people toward common goals of reconciliation and peace for every person. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God of hope, you stand with the suffering and give strength. Comfort your people filled with fear or anger, anxiety or shame. Bring healing to all who are sick in body, mind, or spirit. We pray especially for those we name silently or aloud. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of restoration, you call us to trust in you and not ourselves alone. Make this congregation a community of humility and repentance, ready to encounter you in love and follow in your ways. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of eternal life, to you be the glory forever. We give you thanks for all who have fought the good fight, finished the race, kept the faith, and now live with you. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. With grateful hearts, we commend our spoken and silent prayers to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, you have brought us this far along the way. In times of bitterness, you did not abandon us, but guided us into the path of love and light. In every age, you sent prophets to make known your loving will for all humanity. The cry of the poor has become your own cry. Our hunger and thirst for justice is your own desire. In the fullness of time, you sent your chosen servant to preach good news to the afflicted, to break bread with the outcast and despised, and to ransom those in bondage to prejudice and sin. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, we await the day when Jesus shall return to free all the earth from the bonds of slavery and death. Come, Lord Jesus, and let the church say amen. amen. Send your Holy Spirit, our advocate, to fill the hearts of all who share this bread and cup with courage and wisdom, to pursue love and justice in all the world. Come, spirit of freedom, and let the church say amen. amen. 
Join our prayers and praise with your prophets and martyrs of every age, that rejoicing in the hope of the resurrection, we might live in the freedom and hope of your Son. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Let us join together to pray the prayer that Christ himself has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come, for the table is set, and all are welcome.
Amen. Amen. Um, please keep in your prayers this week. Um, our organist, Mike Harrison, he was exposed to COVID. Um, it's the difficulty of being a gig musician when this is still going on. And so keep him in your prayers. And thank you, Roland, uh, for sitting in at a moment's notice this morning. <laughs> um, we are blessed by the talents and skills of the faithful, and we give thanks. Let us join together with the post-communion prayer. God of the abundant table, you have refreshed our hearts in this meal with bread for the journey. Give us your grace on the road that we might serve our neighbors with joy. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The God of peace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you, comfort you, and show you the path of life this day and always. Amen.